Hello and welcome to this British Academy event. I'm Frahana Hyver. I'm a journalist and broadcaster and a presenter for the BBC Witness History, uh, which is um, a history programme on the BBC World Service, which looks at important events in history through the eyes of the people who were there. Founded in 1902, the British Academy is the UK's leading organisation for the humanities and social sciences. They are an independent fellowship of world leading scholars a funding body that supports new research, both nationally and internationally, and a forum for debate and engagement. Today's event is the second in a series called Why History, in which we'll be joined by British Academy Fellows and funded researchers to discuss insights from the past which help us make sense of the present. I am delighted to be joined by Dr Caroline Bressy. Caroline is a former British Academy Mid-Career Fellow and researcher in cultural and historical geography at UCL. Her research explores the ordinary lives of black men and women in Victorian Britain, shedding light on the black presence in Britain before the wind rush. She has also investigated anti-racism movements during this period in her book, Empire, Race and the Politics of Anti-Caste. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Caroline to our virtual stage for a discussion about her fascinating research. She and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes before taking a selection of audience questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit this in the YouTube chat. You are, of course, welcome to tweet during the event and can copy in at British Academy. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you. So in this event, so in this event, we're going to explore your work in the lives of black men and women during Victoria, during the Victorian period. But before we dive into that, could you tell us how you came to be interested in this particular area? Well, actually, it began with statues, which very topical again. <laughs> but I'm a Londoner born and bred. And in my undergraduate days, I was interested in urban landscapes and public history, a sort of aspect of cultural geography. And I was wanting to do for my undergraduate dissertation something on representations of black women in London's urban landscape. But what I quickly realised was there weren't really any. So I was interested to find out why that was. And part of that was thinking about the historical geographies of those women who weren't there and sort of thinking, well, where are the women that could have been sort of portrayed in that landscape? So although originally I started off perhaps more interested in the representations of history, more and more my work has focused in the archive on bringing that history to light. So in your research, you must have uncovered some wonderful stories and characters. Um, do you have any favourites? That's a good question, because I guess my my favourites have, have perhaps changed over time. So in earlier periods, when I was perhaps more interested in thinking about who were these people missing from the urban landscape, I was, um, I was pretty impressed by characters who were not badly known now, someone like Mary Seacole, um, who it was a struggle to get a blue plaque or, or various plaques for her at particular times. But but that situation's changed now. There is there is a statue of her outside um, St Thomas's Hospital now. I was interested in, and very impressed by photographs of Sarah Forbes Bonetta, who was um, part of Vic Queen Victoria's circle. Her daughter Victoria Randall was Queen Victoria's goddaughter. But more recently, as reflected in my more recent research, as you said, and it's research I always did, is thinking about more ordinary lives. And it's harder to pick favourites there because some ways don't know that much about all these people. They're brief, brief references in newspapers or, or lines in pages. And, and I guess part of what attracts me to people is a little bit my imagination, the, the thought of what it must have been like to, to be someone working in the circus or what it must have been like to be someone um, looking for work as a nurse or working as a working in a club, looking for work in a theatre and um, re really connecting in an imaginative way with really different people from all walks of life. So I'd be curious to go uh, know how you go about finding uh, out about the ordinary lives of, uh, of black people during this period. I mean, I can imagine that that's really hard to find any information about them. 
So yeah, that's also something that's changed quite a lot over the, the past what, 20 years that I've been doing this work. So when I first started out on my, um, my dissertation and my PhD, the usual mm. places that you'd look for this kind of information, people that might have done family histories will know that the Victorias produced a huge amount of stuff. They produced the national census, they were good record keepers, they have birth certificates, marriage registers, all sorts of information that you can find out about them. But the colour of a person's skin was not regularly recorded in those archives. So the national census, we don't make a note of what we would today call ethnicity until the late 20th century, actually. Your place mm. of birth is recorded, but if I was particularly interested in black people, more broadly people of colour who were born in Britain. So a uh, place of birth outside the UK wasn't a great indicator for me. But with the digitisation, of things like the census, but also the huge digitization of archives like the British Library Newspaper Archive. Mm -hmm. The sort of the ability to search for tiny words has made a massive difference. So I can search for things like coloured and nurse and see what comes up. And there you get to find all sorts of people who were looking for work as nursemaids, as nurses to children in people's homes. You can find ayahs, butlers, um, men of colour who worked on stage in performances for things like Uncle Tom's Cabin. A whole world has really been opened up by the digitisation of, of newspapers. There are problems with it. It's not um, it's not perfect. Um, I've been hoping and trying to find out more about um, Chinese histories in the late 19th century and, and that method through newspapers hasn't been as effective as I might have hoped. Mm -hmm. So I'm still working on that. But it, it's definitely been a, a transformative moment, a real digital turn. <laughs> So when going back to kind of researching the ordinary lives of, of, of ordinary black men and women in Britain, was there um, was there information that you found that you were surprised by? Well, I think the the in some way I use the term ordinary. It's Oh, it's difficult, um, yeah. but sort of the ordinariness of of people's experiences, I think, has has been something that I've I've tried to examine a little bit more. So the fact that people worked in households as domestic servants of all kinds, as as cooks, um, people who were not always at the bottom of the of the ladder among the working mm. classes, people who worked in theatres, young black women who were asked to work behind bars in pubs. They might have been the local barmaid. They might have been um, someone that people went to see perform on the stage and yep. was able to transform people's lives. So I think the breadth of experience is something that I've been really interested in. But it can be tempting to over romanticise that. And I don't want to do that. Of course, it was it was it was complicated and and difficult, and there were moments of of racialization and moments of of real racism. But the the breadth of people's experience and how people live together is what I'm really trying to bring together in my work now. Mm. I mean, I think hearing about ordinary people gives us a great sense of the broader picture when we think about how diverse society was in Britain before the wind rush. Um, so perhaps this is a good moment to move on to some of your other work that you just briefly mentioned there, looking at anti-racism campaigns during this period. Um, I mentioned your book in the introduction, which looked at the life of campaigner Catherine Impey and her political magazine, Anti-Cast. Can you tell us a, a bit about her? So Catherine Impey um, is an amazing woman, I would say. <laughs> she was born <laughs> in Somerset in um, 1848. She lived in Somerset her whole life and she had a very strong um, conviction in and support for racial equality for want of a better mm -hmm. phrase. She was a committed Quaker and her family were certainly connected to what earlier were the anti-slavery um, abolitionist networks, which members of the Quaker community were certainly a part of. She mm. continued that work, but she did see it as different. She understood um, the work that she did when she founded Anticast in 1888 
not simply as a continuation of the of the anti-slavery movement, but dealing with what she called racial prejudice and challenging what she called white supremacy. So the the sort of particularly in the United States, where a politics of white supremacy was challenging the end of enslavement and the new political rights that African Americans were um, gaining for themselves, and she was very much um, connected to networks of Af African Americans. But her journal wasn't only concerned with racial prejudice in the United States; it also looked to things that were happening in India, to South Africa, and also on occasion in Australia as well. So uh, she wasn't working on anti-racism campaigns alone, was she? Um, your book revealed a whole network of activists and many uh, who visited her home in Somerset. Could you tell us uh, more about some of the people that she was working with? Yeah, so she did have this really interesting international network and, and indeed her, her journal Anticast, which was relatively small, she published it every month. But what it really was, was a kind of a collation of material from around the world, written as far as possible by people of colour from India, from South Africa, particularly the United States, who would send her material and that she would republish as a sort of way to get other people's voices out there in their own words. So... Some of those people that she worked with, Ida B. Wells, people might have heard of Ida B. Wells, uh, an, an early mm -hmm. feminist, an anti-lynching campaigner who grew up in the United States, an African-American. Her parents were born enslaved and um, died when she was relatively young, when she was still a teenager. And she sort of had to take on looking after her family and through her experiences of trying to get work travel she became very involved in the emerging civil rights movement in the United States and came to Britain twice um, to visit Catherine and to be part of anti-caste campaigns in their particular anti-lynching campaigns that was particularly Ida B Wells's um, particular concern but um, Catherine also knew Frederick Douglass the great um, and civil rights activist. She also worked with Celestine Edwards who was born in Dominica um, and had settled in Britain probably in the 1870s um, as a young man and he probably, it's always hard to say firsts, but he was probably Britain's first newspaper editor. He edited a journal called Lux, which was distributed all over the country. He lectured all over the country to gain support for it. And he worked with Catherine on their anti-racism campaign and for a while um, edited the journal um, when it became known as Fraternity. But sadly, he became ill after editing it for only sort of had been in charge for about a year or so when he became ill and, and sadly died back in, in the Caribbean. So then Catherine took up the editorship again. But she was part of a really amazing um, multi-ethnic and international um, network. And, and her firm belief was that you had to work together in a collective in order to bring about an end to racial prejudice. Yeah. So she would commission these people um, to write for her magazine. Well, she may not necessarily directly. So what um, what some of the African American journalists who were existing at the time were very critical of the white press, because they the, one right. of their arguments was that the white press takes um, they have their story, their version of the news, which gets mm -hmm. distributed, and there's never any voices. They don't take on the voices of of African Americans themselves. Mm -hmm. So Catherine used a, a method which would call cut and paste. So you might recognize it now from things that we do in our Word documents. But then it was quite sneeringly looked at by the Victorians. So you would cut and paste material from other newspapers and put it into your journals. And though in some sort of newspaper circles that was looked down upon as people not doing original journalism for themselves, actually African-American journalists praised Anticast because here was a journal that was taking their words without editing it putting it into the public domain before, as they understood it, a, a, a largely white audience and challenging um, what people were thinking and what they were reading. Yeah, wow, well, fascinating. Really, really fascinating. So much of it still resonates at the moment. Um, we perhaps think of political activism as, as being more focused on urban areas. I'm wondering whether Catherine Impey was unusual in the, in the sense that she was based in the countryside rather than in the city. 
Yeah, I think that's something that's that's certainly really interesting about her. Certainly, in a in a history of women's publishing perspective, it's it's really sort of long assumed that women's publishing was centred around London, and and much of it was, and and uh, but it was also centred around other sort of major cities in in the UK and um, different parts of Britain. So it was unusual. She um, she lived on a farm in essence with her which her following the death of her father her sister ran which allowed her to do her social journalism work she was very aware that being um a woman of certain means and being independently not independently wealthy but independently able to earn an income by helping her sister sell apples and seeds is what they did mainly allowed mm -hmm. her to to do this work and support the work of the journal but it it was almost entirely based in Somerset except when Celestine Edwards took over he lived in London at the time and it was based in London then but her networks were centered around her life in Somerset and she was aware that she sort of says at one point not being part of the Metropolitan Centre might have been mm. something that detracted from her ability maybe to meet all sorts of people yeah. but still it's one of the most radical anti-racist journals of the time so she did pretty well, even. In yeah. So what, happened, <laughs> so what happened to Catherine and uh, her magazine Anticast? And why do you think, um, I mean, a woman that accomplished so much has been largely forgotten? Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Yes, it's an interesting point. I think that works on two levels. One, I think it was because she was a woman. She mm -hmm. didn't get married and she never had children. And so yeah. there was there was much not much of her archive perhaps that was hung on to personally. Most mm -hmm. of what does survive survived as a family archive that was kept by someone, but it's not as extensive as it would have been. The amount of material that would have survived with the publishing archive has mostly gone. I think that's that's partly for two reasons, partly because who it was probably not held on to in the way that it could have been should have been but part of the mm -hmm. reason for that was because as so many <laughs> radical groups find there was a massive split in the organization of which she was a part right. and by okay. the time um she um by the time the celestine edwards death kind of triggered a split in the movement and the the unity of the movement dissolved and so there were there were two journals in the end and neither of which can be found in the British Library in their original copies. They just kind of petered away. And so um, Ron Ware, who had also written about Catherine Impey, sort of said, you know, Ida B. Wells is one of the few people to have written about Catherine and, and sort of mm -hmm. keep people alert to, to her presence. But I think if, if Ida B. Wells hadn't written about her and, and how important their relationship was in the 1890s, it would have been very difficult to pick up any trails on her at all. Um, and that's an illustration of one of the limitations I spoke to in the digitization process. So it's yeah. great that all this material is being digitized at the British Library, but the stuff's got to be there to be digitized. And things like the Bond of Brotherhood, which was another version of the journal, Fraternity and Anticast aren't there. And so they're not going to be part of this great new digital archive. And so perhaps they become even more marginal than they were before. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there is much discussion now about being more than non-racist. Instead, people talk about the need to be anti-racist. I mean, um, I'd be interested to know what Catherine Impey's work can tell us about the concept of anti-racism during this period. Was there a defined idea? So, I mean, Catherine has really interesting ideas on this. So she called her journal anti-caste because she didn't want to use the race, the word race at all. She's like, even right. by evoking the word race, you bring to mind an idea that has no justification. So that's why she used the word caste and she, and as a way of trying to deal with this. Um, and in the journal, she sort of uses inverted commas. She uses underlinings. Mm -hmm. Like many of us, she's trying to, what's the right word? What's the right terminology? 
but she was also very clear which I think does set her apart at the time that racial prejudice as she called it was a white person's problem so racial prejudice had been created to support certain kinds of norms and relationships white people had created those and it was their responsibility to dismantle them so it wasn't about racial equality being uplift for black people and once they reached a certain level we could all celebrate that moment that was irrelevant it was about power it was about opportunity and that racial prejudice was a social construction and she was a very alert to those issues and I think that theorization of thinking about racial prejudice is incredibly um, interesting and important in ways that we think about racial prejudice and how it gets dealt with and addressed by allies and people of colour today. I mean and the language used as well this her thinking about um, using anti-caste instead of racism and, and how we decide to uh, the language we use is so important and she was very much aware of that she was aware of it but also just how difficult it is to overcome it mm. so what it was to be um uh you know how do you use a language of race to overcome racism so even using um anti-caste which she sort of at the time in the United States was a, a term that was being used to think through um, a constructed system of race that did of course borrow in a way from the Indian caste system but, but she sort of sp said to a friend when she first started using anti-caste she wasn't aware of, of ideas and theorizations from the Indian caste system she took mm -hmm. it from an American interpretation of that but the idea was that it was about social construction and mobility Whereas, of course, other other people in India might have viewed that interpretation, didn't view, view that interpretation mm -hmm. differently. So it, it was this constant pull of there being no perfect language. Um, and yeah. you can see that in the way that the sort of comments in the masthead under anti-caste change over time. Um, they yeah. go from being, you know, supporting all sort of all people to being about a brotherhood still a very gendered language um mm. so it's it's you know those issues of intersection um were not things that she was o able to overcome but she certainly tried to address them and at least she was challenging them and interrogating them in ways that made me really think when i was reading her work mm. Mm. so what do you think anti-racist um might have meant for catherine uh, MP and her fellow activists during this period. What do you th what do you think anti racist meant for them? Well, I think for for Catherine, it was I mean it was a real it was a real battle against about against kind of violence. I mean you know the sort of the work that they did on the anti lynching campaigns in the United mm. States was was about a deeply violent society. Um, about people who can get on a train and be sure that they would get off at the end, about people who didn't receive fair trials, um, about people who can get um, equal access to work. Some of those stories are really familiar still. Um, mm. in, in the work that they covered in India, it was about more around labor inequalities and people um, not receiving sort of fair treatment or even humane treatment when they worked on tea plantations. In South Africa, it was about the politics of what would become apartheid and, and really blatant racial segregation. So there was also an understanding that what racial prejudice looked like and how it manifested itself was different in different places and how you had to respond to it meant you needed different tactics and different ideas in different places too but one of the absences there wasn't a huge amount about racial prejudice in Britain and I think right. that's one of the absences in the journal and it's a curious one it's one that Catherine does address at, 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 at certain points um, she says it's not because it doesn't exist but because it manifests it way it's itself very differently um, but I think that is perhaps a moment where she wasn't particularly close to working people of colour in Britain and maybe if she had been 
that would have enabled her to to find a way into hearing about other people's experiences closer to home. So do you think that she um, had found out more about um, the lives of, 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 of black people in, in America than she would have, than she did about the lives of black people in, in the UK? I think I think there was some I think there was something in that clearly when she met and worked with Celestine Edwards who was um was based in the UK for some years that would have changed and perhaps if he hadn't died you know that just the the, mo the way personal relationships really affect activist movements you know if he hadn't died that might have really really changed he was certainly very um connected to a broad working class movement thousands of people used to come and, and hear him speak about all sorts of um things from from religious texts to to darwin so he, he was he was very popular and and surely they would have had conversations that might have challenged her ideas but she certainly had very personal connections with African Americans and I think also the United States at the time was a really violent place yeah. and so that perhaps attracted a certain kind of attention um, which triggered certain kind of political moments which is perhaps again a relationship that we're you know not unfamiliar with that 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 particular moments across the Atlantic trigger particular reflections in the UK. Yeah. I mean, we're living through that now with the murder of George Floyd and, and the reaction in the UK and globally. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, we're still uh, seeing seeing um, results of that um, happening in the present time. But, you know, it's nearly time to take a selection of questions, but I, I'd love to know, Caroline, um, what you're planning next and tell us about uh, what you're working on at the moment. So what I've been, um, I'm working on a couple of things, which has changed <laughs> direction a little bit, but I'm working on a, a sort of big project, which is what I was um, supported um, through the British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship, was um, writing up these stories on um, on sort of ordinary working class people but I've been working on trying to make it into a narrative that's not so academic and is mm -hmm. more available um, I hope for a, a broader audience um, there's such great stories stories about people who worked in the circus people who were as I mentioned working as actors on stage in Uncle Tom's cabin people who worked behind the bar as barmaids so um, but that's been a really different process for me and and a really different way of writing and thinking through my work and not having so many footnotes <laughs> so um i'm sort of <laughs> um working through um through that and um and it's been it's been really great and a really enjoyable experience um and and i think i'll probably be continuing that but i might also go back to statues um one of the things catherine imp and um celestine edwards wrote about they were both very, very critical of Cecil Rhodes. And I've been sort of very interested in the Rhodes must fall debate about sort of how much justification has kind of been given to you. Well, you know, he was a man of his time. People weren't critical of him then. Catherine Impey and Celestine Edwards were deeply critical of him. They weren't the only ones at all. And I think actually going back to thinking about a broader history of, of sort of anti-racism might be something that I go back to again as well. That all sounds hugely interesting. Um, I'm, I look forward to finding out more about that later as you're working on it now. <laughs> Caroline, thank you so very much for a fascinating conversation. So we're now going to open up to audience questions and I'll choose a selection to put to Caroline. So already a couple in. Um, Caroline, someone would like to know uh, more about the black presence in rural areas in the 19th century. Is there any information on how people of colour were living in the countryside and what sort of jobs they were doing? Um, so that that is a very good question. So there's, because of the way the census is structured, we're never, I would argue, ever going to know how many black people lived in Britain. That's just not a kind of demographic statistic we're ever going to have. 
TV producers are always really annoyed when I tell them that. <laughs> but um, it, it's just not there. There's just no way of knowing who in the census is 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 black or not. So mm. on the one hand, it's very difficult to know. Uh, uh, you know, Mary Matthews living in the countryside um, may have been a black woman and may not have been. Um, there's various ways of, of, of trying to unpick that a little bit more. Um, there were... So I guess, so in some ways the answer is I haven't, I couldn't tell you about any particular jobs. There were certainly people who did work as as, as farm hands, but whether they're one-offs or not, it's it's hard mm -hmm. to know. There are certainly people who worked as um, domestic servants in large country houses um, and country estates that had been something that is happening from the 17th, 18th century all the way through to the 19th and 20th century. And you can certainly see in the adverts that I've looked at in the 19th century that there are still, um, it would still seem to be that there's an association of, of black men working as butlers, working as coachmen, which slightly harks back perhaps rather uncomfortably to, to some of the, the stereotypes of, of, of black men, men who were enslaved and the kind of representations they had um, and jobs, roles they had on 18th century estates that belonged to people who, who had slaves in, in plantations mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, for example. Um, but there are also people who would have passed through the countryside. So one of the things I found really fascinating doing the research that I did on, on sort of black performers in, in circuses is that these places just went, you know, to the smallest, smallest places in in to the edge of sort of villages in Norfolk to, to sort of villages you know throughout Wales and throughout the West Country in England and they had a huge diversity it's not just that there was a, a, a black person performing but there would have been um, people for, who were Irish people who were French people who were German sort of all performing together in the circus and as I say I try not to over romanticize it but it is hard <laughs> sometimes when you kind of think <laughs> Think of just what seems to be this amazing kind of motley collection of people yeah. um, moving through tiny villages now that we would not think of as as being sort of connected to ethnic diversity in in any way, um, yeah. and and sort of really seemingly welcoming and in, and enjoying these sort of great celebrations of of art and daring of, of, that was sort of part of the Victorian circus. Um, the Victorian circus had its difficulties too, but I think there's there's a lot of, of joy to be found in, in some of those moments. That's lovely, fascinating. I mean, you touched on it briefly there, but someone is really interested in finding out about, has your research, you know, um, into Victorian black rural lives, has it extended into Wales? I mean, you mentioned it there briefly, but has your research extended there? Um. A, a, a little bit, a little bit. I have to admit, with my most recent work, I thought, thought really seriously about whether it was going to be about Britain um, or whether really it was about England. Um, and it and it has focused on England. It's not, and of course we know that people move between England and and Scotland um, and Wales, but um, but I have focused mostly on England. But there certainly are moments when. Um, there are those those crossovers. So lots of um, tours of Uncle Tom's Cabin um, mm. for theatre productions can be found happening in in Wales and in Scotland. Um, there are um, references to sort of mixed race relationships that I've of people that have that lived in Wales at one point and then have moved back to England. So I have to admit it's not been the focus of my research, but there is great research going on on black history mm. in Wales, um, particularly around um, the Butte Town histories, but also more recently there's been research projects at um, the universities in Wales looking at the communities that were affected by the 1919 riots and sort of great insight plays and so on. So there is it's really great work that's happening on, on black history in Wales, which I'm really excited to sort of look forward to and, and hope to sort of intersect my work with. Well, that kind of connects again to another question that someone's asking about um, your research and does it focus on geographical areas? Um, so they're asking, how do we trace black Victorians in regions and provinces, i.e. Paisley in Scotland? So, um, 
I would I would with something like that I would really try and start with with local newspapers um mm. it's just it's it is a really interesting way to to try and find out things if you're interested in a particular location to look at um local newspapers and just see what kind of stories um emerge try the advertising pages see who was um performing in particular shows people peel off they stay they meet people um mm. people who go and see those shows maybe talk about it in the newspapers the newspapers can be a way of picking out a character who is a needle in a haystack and you wouldn't otherwise be able to find them obviously mm. if you've got names or family connections you can do that kind of family history work but if you're just kind of thinking about i wonder who might have been here the newspapers can be a really great place to start with great a research project there for someone to start delving into newspapers tell um, me what you find <laughs> let caroline know yeah um, let me know this is a, an education question caroline so uh, someone's asking black black victorians um what books would you recommend to teach to primary school children oh does it have to be books um no i, I, say that. Not, I mean is it just is think so one of the what I did once do um a workshop with um teachers um with the um history teachers and one of the ways we thought about doing it was looking through local histories of institutions because the victorians mm -hmm. did tend to have good institutional histories and they quite often have photographs attached to them and they usually connect to local people so one thing that we did in that workshop is to look look at the histories of a local asylum and you can find quite interesting and a sort of breadth of diverse stories there so it's about a local place which may or may not still exist perhaps if it's been turned into luxury flats that's something interesting to talk about it might be something that people the kids um parents remember people who might have worked there but also medical records although um they can have difficult histories in them they can often they do sometimes reveal quite a lot of information about people so were they married um where did they live before they came into the asylum um what were their sort of kinship networks so if you're sort of thinking about local history projects the local workhouse or the local asylum or the local hospital can be a great place to start and um, particularly if the archives um are in a in a local sort of archive center that you can one day access not at the moment sorry <laughs> but someday <laughs> we'll be able to get back into archives um and i think they're really great ways of sort of bringing the local history alive you know it doesn't have to be that um young people who have no connections to london have to learn about black history in london they are diverse histories all across the country and i think mm. you know the what we all want to know about is the histories of our local areas i think more than anything um, what was the place I lived in like a hundred years ago? Great answer and a, and a really, really good question as well. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Staying on the education theme, um, someone's saying, well, it's appalling how little the majority of schools teach black about black uh, or uh, people of color history in the UK. How do you think we could continue to encourage to change the curriculum? I mean, you and I were chatting about this briefly before, but mm. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's a long, hard battle that people have been working on for many, many, many years. Yep. There are some, there are more, perhaps more successes than initially people realise. So there are opportunities in the curriculum for material to be taught, perhaps say around um, migration. Um, I think the key issue that always seems to come up is about resources so perhaps there might be space but if the resources aren't available what do we do and of course it's fair enough for me to say 
oh, you know, you could do a great project about your local asylum. And the teacher says, I have no time <laughs> to put together material <laughs> on a local asylum. And, and that is perfectly true and perfectly fair enough. And I think thinking about um, how we produce resources. So there is, there was, um, there's been a great website created called Migration Stories, where you could, there are sort of a whole range of migration stories available, um, which is a good place for resources. Some of it aimed directly at, at teachers, but more generally. Um, but I think it will be an ongoing battle and one that is going to change as well, right? You know, what we think are important stories to be told now aren't necessarily what we think will be important stories to be told in 20 years time. So I think it's not about fixing a history that's to be told, but it's about um, opening up the opportunities for people to be taught different mm. histories and most importantly, to give people the tools to think about history critically. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a, a, an interesting question on the census actually. What, someone's asking why exactly did it take so long for ethnicity to be recorded in the census. This seems in opposition to the one drop rule in the US. So why was that, Catherine? Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I think it's a really interesting question. It's not that the Victorians weren't interested and in parts of the empire, um, what we might sort of think about as ethnicity was recorded, although not always successfully. Um, but um, but in other parts of empire, say in South Africa, um, mm. asylums were segregated according to the colour of a person's skin. In Britain, nothing like that ever happened. Um, in the United States, the census certainly was um, very important in recording where people who were identified in particular ways through the one drop rule, for example, were located. The British census or yeah, the, the census of England and, and Wales and, and Scotland weren't set up that way. Um, so and but I don't I think I don't think it's right to say it's because they weren't concerned about it, but it clearly didn't concern them in the same way at home. Right. But, you know, it's different. The French census is also very, you know, the French census still doesn't collect that information. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's the way it sort of fits into national psyches and, and the, the role that it's seen to, to un undertake is, is is important in the politics of that and how it changes over time is important so when people start to fill it in for themselves when they're recorded by other people when religion comes in um all those kinds of things reflect particular things that are considered important at particular moments um and there's particular reasons why in the 90s ethnicity is perhaps seen as important um but it's, it'll be interesting to think about whether we think that was a good thing or not and in 50 years time it will certainly make the research easier yes which is a good thing um, <laughs> and, and caroline more broadly a broad question here how were black people treated in the victorian times as a whole is it are you able to answer that um i mean i think it's really hard um to make that kind of judgment i think people's experiences were were different. Some people, um, some people died in racist attacks. Some yeah. people um, married white men or white women and had families that have generations of descendants that still live in Britain today. Some mm -hmm. people were really very celebrated at the time. Um, someone like Samuel Coleridge Taylor, the musician and composer who people will have heard more about now, um, hugely, hugely popular, um, kind of considering how, for how long he was forgotten, it's it's hard to, to sort of imagine how popular he was. But there are still reflections of the fact that he encountered racism um, with his wife on the, on the streets. Um, it's, it's really hard to tell. And I think there are very few personal accounts um of that given 
that give an expression to it but I think mm. the sense is that it that it that it that of course it occurred but people would have experienced it differently and a single person might have experienced it differently in different days people who experience white racism also had white friends and I think you know it reflected a complexity that it is familiar but was different to what how we understand it today so going from something quite broad to again um uh, discussing uh, the lives of black people in victorian uh, britain uh, this is more specific so have you found evidence of black people working in industry in the victorian period um particularly engineering um no okay but i haven't looked i haven't looked <laughs> i have to admit i haven't looked in engineering i mean my guess would be that um well no that would be interesting so i guess uh, if that's a question about about black people who would have been engineers um yeah. i don't i i don't know and none spring to mind but certainly there were celestine edwards worked as a laborer in um in sort of parts of the north before he became a journal mm -hmm. editor he certainly was involved in laboring work um certainly black people worked on ships in in all sorts of capacities often relegated to the sort of the lowest posts but um but they were they were there in that I guess is an industrial kind of job kind of work um but I think that's probably you know one of the things I always say is not enough people working on it if you think of yeah. all the people working on 19th century studies on the Victorians just all the books on the railways that there are you know whether the amount of work that's actually been done thinking about the black presence on the railways there's not much so I think there's just a huge amount of research more research to be done. Yes, I mean, I think touching on that and more research needing to be uh, needing to be done. Someone's uh, picked up on the fact that there are lots of missing stories in the landscape and that we touched on that. What advice would you give to museums to try and uncover these people and the stories from these localities? Uh, that's a good question too. I have spent many hours <laughs> with museums. <laughs> Um, asking these questions and and it's not easy um, because sometimes it means really thinking differently so you've got to um, sometimes think it's sometimes about rethinking the collections that are there but also sometimes it's about um, getting new collections and sometimes the histories are never going to be found so what does that mean um, English um, heritage English heritage historic England oh, I can't remember how they split up but it's recently um, revealed these five um, new portraits of black people related to their sites which they've commissioned as a way of sort of rethinking their collections and um, making those connections to their historic sites um, historic the royal historic palaces are looking to to broaden um, the interpretations of their sites um, over the next few years, the National Trust are doing it. So various organizations are trying to do it. Um, and I think we're at, you know, a little bit late, but we're, the process is, is gathering pace. What I hope is that those things won't just focus on histories of slavery and mm -hmm. connections to um, histories of slavery and compensation payments important though that work is but there'll also be space for um for the black history of of individuals some of whom will be connected to those histories directly and and some of whom will have lived very differently not on country estates um not directly connected um to those networks of of finance and and and, and economic trades so um Museums have a lot of work to do, but they've been, <laughs> yeah, they've, yeah, they've heard it all before. They know what to do. It's about bringing people in. It's about broadening collections, broadening the narratives and mm. thinking about the new narratives that can be told and not just about black histories, but about a whole breadth of histories that need to be rethought. So 
broadening broadening their agenda so um a little bit of a troubling question here a troubling question um about your research have you done any research into um reports of racism in victorian times um so if so there are different kinds of of racism if you're an irish catholic in in 19th century london then <laughs> then um you know your experiences of racism are, are, can be pretty acute um and and there are prejudices that um that people that jewish people experience as well color racism um is perhaps perhaps understood slightly differently i think we're still trying to 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 figure out um how mm. it was how it was seen as as a kind of broad brush e experience um this sort of the uh, this idea of white supremacy that's building that catherine refers to um in in the 1880s and 1890s is certainly something that people are, are conscious of but i think people express it mostly through their experiences of of racism in trying to get work um or their experiences of of um of just of, of daily life really that's mm. that's how it, it gets expressed um there are um there's the the case of a woman that i've looked at called grace um ann stevenson who was a domestic servant and she committed suicide in the early 20th century but in her suicide mm. note as it was reported by the press she she does reflect that and and um, on the fact that she faced racist taunts on the street and she was tired of it. Um, but her experience does talk to those complexities that I've discussed of that um, one of the witnesses at the inquest was also her friend who was a white woman who who said, yeah, she got she got taunted on the street and spoke of, of how painful that was for her. And then another case, um, again, in the early 20th century of a of a of a case of a couple um, who go to court because their landlords try to throw them out, um, and one of the witnesses there is is the the mother-in-law of the black man in the case, and she's a white woman, and she says that she believes that the landlords trying to throw them out because they are a mixed couple, um, mm. but she notes that this is the first time this has happened to them. In that case, the magistrate finds for them they. And, and finds that they can't be thrown out of their home. But the but what I find interesting about that case is the way that um, the mother says this isn't something that's happened before and perhaps suggests that the First World War marks a change in attitudes towards colour racism, where it perhaps becomes much more ingrained. Um, Grace Stevenson kills herself in 1919 a very violent year, a year of, 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 of race riots across, across Britain. So one of the ideas is that perhaps colour racism becomes much more entrenched in the early 20th mm. century. And that's perhaps something that we might be rather uncomfortable with. But I think um, that's also something that I'm, I'm trying to investigate a little bit more. That's really, really interesting. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions, but let's going back to Catherine's journal, Anticast, someone's asking, um, how was it received at the time and did it get get much reach beyond liberal circles? Um, it, it's hard to know because um, it was it was distributed broad a lot of it was distributed for free so there are the subscription the subscribers who supported it and you're right that they were broadly um, they were what we might call liberal circles um, but they made a huge effort in essence their subscriptions paid for it to be distributed across the country so it would go to public reading rooms in Yorkshire it went to public reading rooms in in Scotland and and to sort of places across the country they would put copies in cafes they put copies in public libraries but of course there's no way of knowing how many people actually read them in those places we've all picked up a free magazine <laughs> <laughs> in a in a library or a cafe and and maybe yes. we've read it and maybe we haven't there are some mm. there are some interesting occasions when a few things that do get survive in the archives when um say uh, a, a clearly a very very angry white person has sort of scrawled across the copy of of anti-cast and sent it back and said you don't know what you're talking about this is all nonsense um so that suggests that it did um get 
um, into circles where it challenged people, but um, and it was certainly very well received by a broad African American press that did write about it and responded. It gets picked up in in broader newspapers, like sort of um, regional Liverpool newspapers that write about it. But um, I think the fact that we know so little about it today is a reflection of the fact that it that it isn't really picked up hugely. Yeah. Um, it's run by a woman. It's radical. It uses terms like white supremacy. Perhaps it's not that surprising, sadly. <laughs> it's going to get much, much pick up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Caroline, I, I, I've, I've got, I think I've got time to squeeze in one more question. Um, can you draw any parallels from the anti-caste journal and the Black Lives Matter movement? Are there any lessons we can learn from that violent era to help in this one? Oh, that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, I so one of Catherine's um, greatest um, arguments was the belief in international solidarity. She really felt that international solidarity was key, um, that that was about trying to understand each other, but also sort of building a support network for people. Um, I think that's something that people coalescing the Black Lives Matter um, has 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 done very successfully, um, and has shown that 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 is really important. Um, mm -hmm. That that thinking about language and those kinds of things is important. Um, but maybe there was a character called Jacob Christian, who I just maybe got time to quickly say. Jacob Christian was was based in Liverpool, and he. Um, he sh he's the sort of person I would have expected to read anti-caste. So he was involved in, but he was concerned about the lives of black seamen in Liverpool, people who were coming off ships and not finding work. He married a white woman in Liverpool and settled in the city. And he was part of the same networks that Catherine was. But certainly one of the things that, um, he didn't seem to be part of the anti-caste journal community and that's really curious and perhaps he couldn't afford it even though it was a penny perhaps he just wasn't a subscriber perhaps he did read it in one of those free reading rooms but perhaps mm. reading wasn't enough for him that that being part of a reading community wasn't enough and what he was interested in was action and meetings and so that perhaps finding the balance between reading and talking and discussing in action is is what the sort of what we really want to be trying to aim for um not always easy and of course there are some great people that are able to do it and you know, angela davis those kinds of people and that's why we admire yeah. them so much um and and how we how we develop more pathways to to support ourselves to do that kind of work i i think is perhaps a, a lesson to be learned from that not easy at all caroline thank no. you so very much for giving up your time thank to you. talk to us and answering our questions with really interesting thank you. Uh, illuminating answers thank you so much thank you um, and to the wider audience a reminder that this is the second in our series of events under the title why history the next event is on the 19th of november and you'll find details of that on the british academy website thank you again to caroline for joining us and thank you very much <laughs>